So, while we wait for my incredibly skilled technical staff to figure out why the ROM suddenly coughed and died, thanks, Sky, I thought this might be a good time to address the game that this ROM is based off of, Final Fantasy VI. Three in the West, because two and three were Famicom games that Nintendo didn't bother porting over, four got renamed as two, and five had a job system that Square was afraid would scare the pants off American gamers. Ah, cultural diffusion, you are a strange and complex thing. I'm not going to get too much into the story, because honestly, not much has changed. Final Fantasy VI is especially famous for its large and well-portrayed ensemble cast, at least considering it was a game in the SNES era. And really, a lot of the meta-humor surrounding this ROM is based on how well the character substitutions work, and how badly they fail on the rare occasions they don't work. Right now, at least, I'm more interested in discussing the original characters and exactly where they do and don't differ from their replacements. First up is our original Esper girl, Tara Branford. In the original Japanese game, her name was Tina, because that had an exotic sound. It's a little more common over here, so they changed it to Tara. Of all the characters, in some ways, Tara has the best claim to being the protagonist, considering that her existence pretty much drives the first half of the plot. Tara's magic power set leans toward fire damage, which, sh which sort of echoes her Esper self being very powerful, but very dangerous if not strictly controlled. Why Shiho for Tara? Well, both of them are orphans, both were raised in the organization that acts as the overarching antagonist, and both were used as weapons, and thus are responsible for a great deal of destruction and death that they were not particularly knowledgeable or aware of. Both tend to present as emotionless and are confused by affection, even or including platonic affection. Watching her boggle at the friendship of the other kids and Conan's unthinking protective selflessness is usually a lot of fun. Going in order, we then have Locke Cole. Yeah, they weren't particularly subtle about the naming scheme a lot of the time. Locke got replaced with Shinichi for a number of reasons. There's his chronic hero syndrome, his tendency to get involved with anybody needing his help, and, of course, his shocking disregard for the concept of privacy and personal property when he feels something more important is at stake. Amusingly enough, Shinichi thinks thieves are boring. While Locke's protective streak is aimed more at women due to Rachel's condition, Shinichi's is aimed at everybody, but for just about the same reason. A murderer he exposed early on after his shrinking committed suicide, and Shinichi blames himself for not stopping the man sooner, both to save his victims and the man himself. Then, of course, there's Edgar, a man whose flirtatious nature basically hides the mind of a genius gadgeteer and a strong sense of duty and obligation to his people. Suguru... Well, we haven't really seen a lot of him in series, but we know he's a flirt. It's more the ostentatious chivalry type, but he's a flirt. His father is the superintendent of the Tokyo Metropolitan Police, and he's ridiculously rich, which is about as close to royalty as you're going to get in a manga like this. Edgar and Suguru are both fairly sneaky. You kind of have to be to keep up with Kaito Kid. Suguru is also a genius. He's one of the few in the series accorded the title of Metante, Great Detective. His technological skill is less obvious, though apparently his paternal grandfather is the head of a technology development group. Then we have Sabin. A lot of the humor in the recasting of the Figaro brothers comes from the fact that Seguru and Heiji cannot stand each other. At least they couldn't during their first and only in-series meeting. A lot of it's the chalk and cheese thing. Seguru is refined, calm, and posh almost always appearing in a suit, or at the very least a sport coat and slacks. Heiji, on the other hand, is hot-blooded, loud, and abrasively informal, almost always clad in jeans, a t-shirt, and his ever-present baseball cap. On the other hand, they're disturbingly alike, both being sons of high-ranking police officers and both being gifted private investigators and badass fighters. Heiji fits pretty well to Sabin for other reasons, too, being cheerful, loud, and utterly certain of the fact that he does not want to follow in his father's footsteps, no matter what anyone else might think about the matter. Sabin's focus on freedom and his hatred for the superficiality he sees in the Figaro court map pretty well onto Heiji, really. And then we have Celis. Her name was probably supposed to be Ceres after the icy asteroid, but hey. In a lot of ways, she's Terra's foil, having a magic set that leans toward ice, absorbing energy instead of radiating it, and being a bit more of a physical fighter with strong magic, rather than Terra's being a magical fighter who can back it up physically. In addition, when the second half of the game kicks off, Celis takes over the slot as basically the protagonist. Just like Terra, she's the one who drives the plot and the one whose actions we follow until we get enough people that we can drop her from the party. Ron is Celis in part because of her immense physical skill. Ron is, hands down, one of the three, 
three strongest physical fighters in the manga. And while this is a story more about mystery solving than action, that's still saying a lot. Ron's skill has odd professionals. Beyond that, though, it's mostly her relationships with others. She's Shinichi's major love interest, and while a strong fan contingent ships in with Shiho, the manga doesn't really support that, just as Locke never really seems to have romantic feelings for Terra, just protective ones. In addition, Ron's come closer to catching Kid than anybody else, although that was in one of the non-canonical movies. And then there's Shadow. Aside from the whole Man of Mystery vibe and the fact that Akai really doesn't talk a lot, there isn't a lot of comparison here. Although a sharpshooter who can make ridiculous shots isn't a bad comparison to a ninja who can throw anything, I guess. Next up is Kayan Garamond. Yeah, his name in the Japanese is spelled Kayan, like the pepper, so I suspect character limits got them again. I think most people say his name is Cyan because A, that's a real word, and B, his armor, a lot of it is blue. On the surface, Kogoro and Kayan couldn't be more different, with only the hair and the mustache making them a good match. Kayan deeply loves his wife and son. Kogoro, well, he deeply loves his wife and daughter, but he's not always so good at being a husband and father. He's a competent detective, though he's better at investigating than deduction, and he's an excellent fighter. But he doesn't like to train, preparing for friend preferring to spend his time eating, drinking, and gambling. That said, there are a lot of similarities if you look deeper. Kogoro is extremely loyal to people he believes worthy of it, and will go out of his way to protect and support people he respects. He's capable of focusing his attention on a single point or task, and when he does that, he is flat-out dangerous. His sense of honor and morality is ironclad, as people who have tried to bribe him have found out to their sorrow. And he's not exactly great with machines, being a somewhat crappy driver, mostly due to impatience, and having little to no idea what to do with a computer. Yaiba is in for Gao mostly as a case of, uh, who do we have that's close? Yaiba did live for a time on the African belt, though he wasn't abandoned, and he certainly isn't a wild child. And both characters certainly have fewer social graces than normal. Amusingly, Yaiba's sword is the Thunder God sword, which he uses with the Dragon God Orb, and Gao can be powered up in a technique that's often called Wind God Gao. More on that later. Kaito Kid for Setzer works for a lot of reasons. He's a major player in Movie 14, The Lost Ship in the Sky, which also has a certain chibi being thrown out of the airship. And in fact, he actually gets to kiss Ron in that one, which fits well with the Setzer Celis thing. Beyond that, Kit is a magician, but has a very strong secondary thing theme revolving around gambling, mostly poker. Kit gambles his life and his freedom by making his thefts into huge spectacles and inviting the police in certain detective types. He doesn't have his own airship, but he does have a hang glider built into his cape. His main weapon is razor-edged playing cards. And his flashy showmanship, just like Setzer's, is a bit of a mask for serious wound, as Kid is attempting to lure out and stop the people responsible for the death of his father. Strago gets to be a gossip mostly because there aren't too many old men who have recurring roles in this series. But also, Strago is a blue mage, which means he studies the attacks of the monsters. That's a pretty good fit for a gossip who is an engineer. Much like a blue mage, an engineer looks at something and tries to figure out how to do it and do it better. He's also the guardian to I, in a sense. Realm is... actually, she fits I pretty well. She's ten, whereas I is physically six and mentally eighteen, but she still acts extremely mature for her age. She's smart and dangerous. I is all of these things and very fond of Agasa, which mimics the Strago-Realm relationship fairly well. In addition, I is an orphan whose mother left behind a very important item for her. Realm gets the memento ring. I got a series of tapes that formed a sort of audio diary. Then there's Mog. He's fun. Archibi, much like Mog, is adorable and extremely badass. Funnily enough, one of the best relics to equip on Mog in the last half of the game are the Dragoon Boots, an odd parallel to Conan's kick-enhancing shoes. The Moogle verbal tick of Kubo is echoed pretty well by Conan's oft-repeated Adere, which he uses to get the attention of adults who don't know he's anything other than an adorable child. There are two more optional characters in the game, but as we haven't had the opportunity to recruit them yet, I'm just going to leave you hanging for now. Till then, I hope you've enjoyed this character examination, and I'll see you, well, whenever that might be.